Well, week number three, everybody, you asked for it, and uh, and so these were the top three topics that you all picked back in Easter, as you just heard right there. And uh, so we talked about stress week one, talked about relationships last week, and today talking about anxiety. And I'm telling you, this is going to be a timely truth for all of us in the culture in which we live, all right? And uh, so before we jump in, I want to welcome everybody that's watching online, whoever you are, wherever you are, thanks for tuning in. If you're one of our soldiers, one of our servicemen and women serving our country, of which some of you I know are overseas, and that's just amazing that you would tune in and connect with us while you're overseas deployed, but we're so glad that you're with us. Everybody give it up for those watching online today. Hope you're doing good. We love you guys. And y'all, I get the privilege, it truly is a privilege to introduce today our guest speaker, Pastor Toby and his wife, Micah. And uh, they are an incredibly sweet couple. God is using them like crazy in many different ways over the years. And uh, they've been married almost 39 years, almost 39 years, a little over 38 years. And uh, they've been doing ministry together ever since. Uh, they planted a church, was it 2000? Cross Timbers Church, 2000 in Argyle, Texas. I just like to say that, Argyle. <laughs> this is fun. And, uh, man, doing a great job there, amazing church. And, uh, and since then, now they are doing uh, Gobi Ministries, and they founded that together. And you're going to hear more about that, so I'm going to let him talk about that. But just an amazing story of how God is using it, honestly, across the country. And it is so, it is so timely. The Lord knows what he's doing. And it's very timely on what God is doing and transforming many people's lives. And as he's transforming lives... I'm telling you, just giving a lot of practical need to people that there's not sometimes a lot of practical help out there. And so the Lord's really using it in great ways. And so tonight, if you've not RSVP'd, I'm telling you, after you hear him, you're going to be like, we got to go tonight if you haven't already RSVP'd. It's going to be great. And uh, we're so excited to get, get to do that. And, uh, but here's what I want you to do, Rock Hills. Now listen, we've told him that, hey, Rock Hills is a welcoming church. So don't screw this up for me. You know what I'm saying, all right? All right? Hey, would you guys, like you've never done before, would you give it up for my friend, Pastor Toby? Come on now. Brother, got some walk-up music. Come on now. <laughs> hey, I grew up in a small South Texas town, a long way from here, about 15 minutes from the beach. Uh, my Dad was a high school coach in the, now this is the 60s. Uh, my mom was a fifth grade math teacher. She gave me my first B I've ever got in my life. I still have a wound about that. <laughs> but that's a long way of saying we didn't have any money, right? But it's okay. Nobody in my little town had any money. And my parents were creative. And the great thing about having parents who were school teachers is you have a summer where a family can be together, right? And so... We did two things every summer. One was we went to watch the Houston Astros play baseball in the Astrodome. We didn't go because we're Astro fans. In fact, go Rangers. Uh, we, uh, we went because it cost 50 cents to park and a dollar to sit in the outfield bleachers. And so a family of four could take peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a jug of water and for five bucks could have three hours of entertainment. And I watched those guys lose 30 times a summer, man. <laughs> the other thing we did is we went to the beach. We went to the beach like most of you go to the park. We went to the beach, and we would stay three, four, five days in my Aunt Blanche's beach house. When I say beach house, don't think about HGTV. Think Little Shack about a mile off the beach. But it was free, did I mention? And uh, we won. I'll never forget. I was seven years old, I, and I'm... We come back to our house in our little town from this little 15-minute drive from three days at the beach, and we're eating dinner, and our phone rings. Now, some of you next generation don't know this, but we used to have phones that plugged into the wall. It was crazy. You go, well, what'd you do if nobody was there? Well, you didn't talk to them. It was awesome. <laughs> we were bougie, so we had an avocado phone plugged into the wall, and uh, my mom answered it, and I heard her gasp, and she screamed, oh, no. And Dad ran in, and they started talking, and I was seven. I walked in and said, what's wrong? And Dad told me that one of our friends had drowned that day at that beach where we had been. Now, in my growing up years, there were eight people in a, our circle of, of either friends or family or church goers that were with us that drowned at that very same beach. But this is the first I'd ever heard. And I said, Dad, what was he doing? He said he was fishing. 
Well, I watch these guys fish all the time. They're in water to their knees. I said, how does somebody drown in water to their knees? And that's when I first heard about an undertow. Hey, everybody, look at me. Listen, an unseen force that is pulling you somewhere you don't want to go. And the harder you fight it, the more it takes you places. Until dad said, sometimes, son, they don't find your body for days. My dad, did I mention he was a coach in the 60s? Just like this. Son, look at me. This is why we're always careful when we go to the beach. Now go to bed. And I went to bed. Anybody an overthinker? Raise your hand if you're an overthinker. Two hands if you're charismatic. How many hands up? (laughs) See, some of you are thinking about whether you're an overthinker, so you are one. (laughs) Well, I laid in bed that night, and my little overthinking brain started going, what if I drown at the beach someday? I wonder how long it would be before they find my body. I wonder who'd come to my funeral. I started getting mad at people that weren't coming to my funeral and my imaginary drowning. Now, everybody listen. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I didn't know it. I was experiencing it. That your life moves in the direction of your thoughts. And if you consider a negative possibility long enough in your heart, you become convinced it's a reality. And I went to sleep that night, tears running down my face, praying, please, God, don't let me drown. Please, God, don't let me drown. Never believing that that would be my number one prayer that I would pray for the next 57 years of my life. Oh, not drowning anymore in physical water. I haven't been in the ocean past my ankles since that day. And I, I'm not doing it, so build a bridge, get over it. Don't try to fix me. <laughs> very irrational, very real me. No, I'm talking about something a lot of you know that we're drowning when it comes to our mental health. Let me get this out of the way. My name is Toby. I'm not saying it because we're standing in a church service. I love Jesus with all my heart, man. It's like I'm desperate for him. I'm one bad decision away. from calamity my feet never hit the ground in the morning but I don't ask God to fill me with his Holy Spirit to give me some strength that I don't feel like I have my wife Mike and I have been married as you heard almost 39 years Uh, we ask God every day to help us walk by faith And I, almost 30 years ago, was diagnosed with an anxiety and panic disorder. And church people don't know what to do with me. Because I don't fit the mold. Hey, everybody. I know what I'm talking about. I have a 30-year graduate degree in something nobody wants to go to school for. And I've learned what real freedom that Jesus offers is. And what makes me sad is everywhere I go, this is new information to so many of us. See, what Jesus offers, it's called freedom. Not the absence of something but the presence of someone in the middle of something. Let me say that again. Freedom is not the absence of anxiety, depression, of feeling overwhelmed by life. It's not never experiencing those. 
It's having a person named Jesus with you in the midst of those moments that give you a power beyond yourself to not be defined or defeated by your issue. It's better. Freedom is better than anything else we could ever experience. So what I want to do in the few moments we have together this morning is I want to talk to two groups of you. I want to talk firstly to those of you who battle at some level for your emotional health. If you look to your left and you look to your right, unless we are a statistical anomaly here in Manhattan, Kansas today, one or both of the people sitting beside you are in the midst of this battle. And I want those of you who are hurt to understand what the battle really is. And I want you to understand that sometimes you're losing because you're aiming at the wrong target. And for the rest of you, those of you who, you know, I was with a pastor a few weeks ago in, in the Metroplex who I, I thought was so courageous, he stood up and said, you know, I've never, this has never been my battle, but, so I want to bring somebody in to talk to you who understands this issue. Uh, and if that's you, God bless you. I'm so grateful that you are uh, a part of that small percentage in our country and around the world who aren't battling at some level. But can I say something because I don't know you? Could I just say something in love to you? Could I? I'm going to, so y'all talk back to me. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, man, I love you, but you're not helping. I mean, your heart's, I'm not saying your heart's in the wrong place. I want to show you what you can do to help people who are hurting feel better, not just make you feel better. Because you're trying to solve something that only Jesus can solve. Does that be all right with everybody? Now, I need to give you a little bit of context before... I'm always acutely aware of the opportunity the enemy takes to take my words and to, to help you hear something I'm not saying. <laughs> so I think you have to know me a little bit. Number one, uh, I believe in therapy and professional counseling. With all my heart, I, I do. I, I have, if you came to North Texas, there's three of the largest lakes in Texas in the northern part of our state where I live. Like Louisville, like Great Mother, there's these huge, like, you would find boats all over the place that I bought from counselors. The counselors bought them because they used my money. S.S. Toby on Lake Grapevine. I mean, I believe in counseling. I believe that you ought to see a counselor regularly. Everyone should. I believe that you have counselors that come into your life for certain uh, seasons of your life. I think the saddest thing today is that some people go to see a counselor, have a bad experience, and they throw the baby out with the bathwater. And don't keep looking for the one that they can connect with. But I believe in counseling with all my heart. I'm going to talk about that some tonight. By the way, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, even college students, young adults, we have these coming in droves to these uh, workshops. I'm going to help you tonight. See, when I was struggling, I didn't need a sermon. I needed a strategy. I'm going to give you five practical things that I promise you, if you do these things Five minutes a day, five days a week, I promise you in 30 days you will see progress. I ain't going to talk about fidget spinners or weighted blankets. We're going to talk about principles that you can be a strategist, practical strategy. That's tonight, but you need to come. But I believe in therapy. Hey, I believe in medication. Let's just get that out there. I think it is ridiculous that the church has led some to believe that medication is a sign of some kind of weakness. That's ridiculous. Uh, science clearly proves that under emotional duress, there is the very real possibility that, and I'll just put it in, I'll put the cookies on the low shelf, your brain can short out these synopsis of your brain that connect, that there's a short that happens that only medication can heal to the place so you can hear truth that will set you free. And if you break your leg, look at me. Jesus 
heals your leg, right? But you still wear a cast. You're not going, no, Doc, I don't need that. I'm just trusting Jesus. You put a cast on your leg and trust God to heal, right? If you have diabetes, trust Jesus and take your insulin. And if you're battling to a level that you feel like you're losing, it doesn't make you less of a Christian. To be on medication that evens you out mentally to the point that you can hear truth. Are y'all hearing me in the back? Do I need to say it louder for you guys in the back? Look, man, our battle, those of us who battle for our emotional health, at the core, our battle is shame. Quit throwing shame on us, man. We're trying to get better. But you have to remember this. Medication is a resource. It is not your source. It is a resource given by God to point you to the ultimate source, which is Jesus. So I'm for both of those things. But this battle at its core for every one of us is a battle between our feelings and the truth. This is the battle. See, when we're in the midst of of being emotionally depleted, what we feel starts controlling what we know. Jesus said this. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you. See, we all know that, right? Are y'all not playing or y'all didn't know that verse? Because I'll give it to you afterwards. (laughs) We'll know the truth and truth will set you. But most of us don't realize that a lie believed has the same potential to hold us in captivity that the truth does to set us free. Let me say that again. A lie believed has the same potential and power to hold you in captivity that the truth does to set you free. How many of you have ever been struggling in some area of your life, relationally, emotionally, financially, I'm not even talking about mental health. I'm just talking general life. You're struggling, and you feel like your prayers haven't gotten past the ceiling. How many ever prayed that? Oh, how about you holy people in the back that aren't playing this with me because you think I can't see you? <laughs> we go, yeah, I feel like my prayers don't get past the ceiling. Well, the problem with that thinking is God is not past the ceiling. Jesus came to say the kingdom of God is near. It's within your reach. He ain't out there. He's right here beside you. How do you know that? Because God is near to the brokenhearted. But Toby, it doesn't feel like it. You with me? I'm going to tell you, you need to feel your feelings. Like shoving them under the carpet or throwing some religious platitude or cliche on top of it is unhealthy. You want to know what destructive is, though? Let your feelings be the steering wheel of your life. You will end up in the ditch. We have to let what we know control what we feel, not let what we feel control what we know. This is the real battle for those of us who battle for our mental wellness. So I'm going to give you three areas, three lies that I have a hard time getting in the depths of who I am when I'm in the midst of a struggle and what the truth really is. Is that all right with everybody? I want you to write this down. You're gonna, many of you are going to identify with it. Did I mention I know what I'm talking about? Okay, good. Number one, when I struggle, I start thinking, well, there must be something wrong with God. Or say it this way, the Bible works for everybody else but me. The Bible is true for everybody else but me. That stuff that our pastor talked about, that may be true for you, for you, and that may be your experience, but that's not my experience. There's, there's something wrong with God. Could I lovingly say to many of us that it's not the fact that we that the Bible isn't true for us, it's the fact that we don't understand what the Bible really says. Somewhere along the way, at a subconscious level, we begin to believe. That when good things are happening to us, God must be very close. And when negative things are happening, God must not be around. And somehow we've got to read our Bibles more, pray more, go to more Bible studies, be holier. And somehow we'll win God's attention and he'll come and get close to us again. It sounds cool. It's just not in the Bible. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
Anybody remember them in the book of Daniel? The three boys who said, we don't care what you do to us, we ain't bowing to that statue. What did that get them? It got them a death sentence to being executed by being burned by fire. I can think of no worse way to die than by fire. The night before, they are to, the sentence is to be carried out. I mean, I don't know if you guys have thought about this. They're in a prison cell, and they, out there, they started the, the, the human pizza oven, and it's burnt, it's logs, and it, you can smell it, and they're gathered. What do you think those guys were saying to each other? Seriously, what do you think they were praying? What were they saying? They weren't going, this is awesome, dude. We're going to be in the Bible someday. <laughs> what are they asking God to do? Bring a thunderstorm. Put the fire out. Strike these guys down. God, rescue us. Where did they meet Jesus? In the fire, not around the fire. Their problems were the signal of God about to go to work, not God leaving them. And it's almost as if Daniel wants you to understand how God works because the next chapter is Daniel who is more scared of not praying than he is of coming face to face with a hungry lion. That's a series for you, Pastor. More scared of not praying than being sentenced to death. And what did that get him? Face to face with a lion. And by the end of that chapter, a pagan king is issuing a written edict to a pagan nation that Jehovah God is God above all gods because of his time, Daniel's time in the lion's den. Don't tell me miracles don't still happen. And for you church folks here, I want to make you a little uncomfortable. See Jesus. I mean, go look carefully at Jesus' life. Most of us don't have a problem with his deity. It's his humanity that bothers us a little bit. See, if we have to come face to face with his humanity, we get challenged about how we we ought to be living. We can't just blow it off as, well, he was the son of God. Listen, the power of Jesus' life was he was in every way, man. And he says to his best friends, come, come. Keep watch with me. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Hey, hey man, look at me. The manliest man to ever live needed his friends. Why are you trying to do it alone? That's what he said. I can't do this alone. I need my friends. Come on. See him face first in the dirt. Sweating blood. Begging Jesus. I mean, begging his father to not make him go to the cross. Now, we like to skip to not my will, but your will be done because it makes us feel better. But many of us have been face first in the dirt, haven't we? Asking God to not, just don't let this happen. And it wasn't in spite of the cross, it was through that cross that we get to sit here today and celebrate victory. There's nothing wrong with God. I'm getting weary of all these young deconstructionists who are telling me, well, if, there, if God was real, then why did blank happen to me or to someone I love? I don't know. I'm not God. His ways are not my ways. His high, his, as high as the heavens are from the earth, that's how far God's ways are from my ways. One of the most liberating truths that I live my life by is there is a God and I ain't him. But I have staked my life on the fact that God is good and he wants good for me. That he is working in all things. You know why Paul had to say all things in Romans? Because all things aren't good. (laughs) In all things, God is working to leverage my pain for my good because I love him, and he's called me according to his purposes. I don't have to get it to believe it. There's nothing wrong with God. He's at work in your life, even when you don't see it, even when you're not sleeping, even when you're wondering how you're going to get up and face another day. 
even when you feel less than, he is with you and he is at work. And then my favorite is, well, maybe God's at work, but there's something defective about me. This about took me out in this 28-plus year battle that I've had with anxiety and panic disorder. Well-intentioned preachers and teachers leading me to believe that if I was just a better person, I wouldn't be struggling with this. So let me just state this clearly for the record. Anxiety is not worry, and depression is not sadness. And I apologize on behalf of anyone who has proof-text the Bible when they don't know what they're talking about. And this, this belief, this shame that comes when we feel less than because we battle, it's, that's not God. You know that little voice? Y- y'all know that little voice I'm talking about? At night? <laughs> that's not showing your highlights, showing your lowlights? That ain't God's voice. That's somebody else. How many of you have a, a life verse? How many of you guys have a life verse? Raise your hand. I'm going to tell you. I know you have a Bible study or something. Huh? Life verse. <laughs> life verse. You know, I ask everywhere I go. Pastor said a moment ago, you know, these guys travel all over the country. We do. We've been, literally, I've been home about five or six days in the last 40 days. We've been on the West Coast. We've been on the East Coast. Been north. Been south. And the, I tell you that to say I've gotten to talk to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people about this issue. And I ask you have a life verse, and if it's not a long, full room like this, a lot of times people yell them out to me. And so I don't, you don't have to say anything. I know that generally speaking in America we have three verses that are life verses. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me, and nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. Those are great life verses, by the way. The problem is you don't get to pick your life first. Your life first picks you. Right? Let me say that again. You don't get to pick your life verse. You can't pay Bible roulette and, and pick a verse because it sounds cool or you want it on your coffee cup. It doesn't work that way. Your life verse picks you. In your unique life situation, the way God created you, the, the, the victories and the challenges you have, God gives you a living word from his truth that you know, be, that you know, that you know, that you know, beyond a shadow of doubt, that's God speaking this banner over my life. And I honestly don't know how believers operate without one. Because you have, a, you have to have a place to come back to that's solid and secure and true when everything around you, when all hell seems to be breaking out around you. Right? If not, then it's going to be how you feel. Y'all want to hear my life verse? Good. Y'all are smart. Y'all are talking back to me. <laughs> Sister says, I don't want to be here all day. I'm talking back to the brother. <laughs> it's Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, if you're new to the Bible, Paul wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. Paul is the greatest missionary this side of the cross. The reason we get to sit here today is because our, the father of our faith for Gentiles, which is us, is Paul. He brought, it, the Bible, he brought the gospel to us. And Paul is talking about his life in 2 Corinthians 12, and he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, God had given him a gift. Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. God gave him this gift, and he said, to keep me from being proud about it, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. You guys have heard about a thorn in the flesh, right? And everybody debates what that thorn was for Paul. I could stack up books this high, seriously. I ha- I've read them that will give you reasoned opinions about what his thorn was. I'll save you some reading time. Nobody knows. I believe the Holy Spirit prompted Paul to write this way so you would see your thorn in the story, not see you as an exclusion to the principle he's about to give about his life. Like, I'm convinced it's emotional health. Why? Because he says it torments him. And I tell my wife all the time, sometimes, man, when I'm low, I feel tormented, man. People ask me all the time, is, 
is anxiety, is it, is it physical, is it emotional, or is it spiritual? The answer is yes. It's all those things, and it's one of those things. And there are sometimes I need therapy, and there's sometimes I need a sandwich and a nap. And there's sometimes when I need a spirit-filled believer to pray heaven over me and cast the demons out of me. Because it's spiritual warfare. And, and when you try to take, all, you're a whole being, right? So Paul says, if, I feel like I'm being tormented. And here it is, three times I pleaded. Everybody say pleaded. pleaded. Not like, dear God, thank you for this food and all its many blessings and bless it in my body and Jesus. I'm talking about like begging God, pleaded with him to take it away. I don't know if it's three literal times. I don't know if it's over three weeks, three months, three years. But the greatest church planner, this side of the cross, said to God, God, do you know how many churches I could plant? Do you know how much good I could do? If you take this away. But he said to me, no. That's my life verse. Do you want to put that on a coffee cup? No. My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses that Christ's power may rest on me. Are you seeing it? God says, I am going to use your, you had one job, low lights, not your highlights to draw people to myself. Paul's goal when he walked into the room has become my goal. I, I want to be so honest with you about where I sit in this moment that you look at and go, man, God must be unbelievable because that dude's jacked up. That's, that was Paul. He didn't, not only did he not hide his weaknesses, he boasted about his weaknesses. He didn't have it all together. He didn't practice, uh, uh, you know, like sh share, protected sharing. He said, hey, this is my challenge. This is my battle. I'll give you true confession. Y'all want one? I love the fact that I'm an overcomer. I don't like overcoming things. <laughs> right? That's just truth. So what do I do when what God says about me? The truth. Who he says I am. My position in his kingdom when it doesn't match my current condition. Mamas and daddies, look at me. This is the battle that your elementary school kid is having right now. This is what your kid has been, is being told in some area of life. That if your condition doesn't match your position, lower your position to match your condition. I may not be overcoming at this moment, but I am an overcomer. And my fight is to raise my condition to match my position, not the other way around. Every major battle in this country right now at its core is an identity battle. We have no shot of true victory. Unless deep in the DNA of who we are, we understand who God says that we are. I, my only non-negotiable when I come to churches is that I get to go out in the lobby and sign books for people. Not that I care about signing books. I just like to talk to people. And I can't tell you the number of times I have men and women in their 30s and 40s who stand in line for 30 minutes to talk to me to say this, I just can't get past the fact that my dad told me I'd never amount to anything. I just, my mom told me I wasn't pretty and I wasn't competent, and I just don't see myself as pretty or attractive or competent. And I say to men and women all the time, and I'll say it to you, man, I am sorry they said that to you. But they didn't tell you the truth. The only one who has the right to define you is the one that created you. You are who God says you are, whether it feels like you are or not. I was struggling about 15 years ago. I mean, bad. I was in that loop. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You get in this loop, and you can't get out of this loop. Come on, sister. You know what I'm talking about, right? And I called a pastor friend, an older pastor friend in another state, and I said, hey, man, I need some help. I'm struggling. I don't know what to do. He told me, go Google the 40 I am's. Go, go to the CVS, get you some, some uh, index cards, and write 
my hand, every one of those 40 IMs out. I didn't even knew what the 40 IMs were. I don't know if you guys do. Most people tell me they don't. The 40 IMs are 40 statements from the Bible about who God says that you are, right? And I'm desperate, man. He said, go over there, write them down, and then sit at a table by yourself somewhere outside and say them out loud, which sounded weird to me. But see, I didn't understand 15 years ago how verbal my faith was. Y'all, y'all get that Jesus, hey, look here at me. Don't, don't turn on Facebook. Just look up here for a second. Like when Jesus was standing in a, a storm-tossed sea, he did not calm the sea by doing this. He, he could have, but what did he do? He spoke to the sea and said, peace be still. Why? Because in this new kingdom of which he's very near, your words create realities. Be careful what you're saying about yourself. You need to avoid the always never statements that you're making about yourself. You are creating a reality that feels right, but it's not true. So I went to the CVS behind my house. I grabbed me some cards. I wrote every one of these statements out. I wrote the verse out. I was an overachiever. I sat down at my picnic table in my backyard. My wife was coming in the circle driveway in the backyard. I'm sitting at this table screaming, throwing these cards down, bawling my eyes out. People ask me, well, which ones do you, which ones do you pick to call out? The ones I'm having the hardest time believing. Like when I say something that's true that doesn't feel true, that's not hypocrisy. It's called faith. Why do you think there was a quiver in your liver during worship today? These guys are awesome. It wasn't these guys. It was everybody declaring something to be true, even when we don't feel like it's true. And I haven't been anywhere on this planet without these cars for the last 17 years. They're covered in snot and tears and disappointment. They are. They're nasty. But they remind me that there's nothing wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with God. That this is who I am. We've given away 60,000 PDF copies through the years of these 40 I am. In fact, we had a technical difficulty today, so we'll send you an email. If you're on the email list here at Rock Hills, it works? I'm going to send you an email because it doesn't work. It's going to frustrate you. I'll give them to you free. Di- I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm going to give them to you free digitally. Look. This QR code, I call it a barcode. My kids told me it wasn't a grocery store. But um, (laughs) if the link works, I'm just giving them to you free. We'll email you a free digital copy. Uh, Yeah, we're going to have them for you. But I want you to have the digital one because it's on my phone. So every time I pick my phone up, my phone has a picture of one of these 40 AMs. You know the one I have the most, guys? On my phone, I am stronger than I feel right now. Now, I'm going to finish with this, but I want you to hang with me because everything I've said is to get you to this. Many of us have a belief that if, if God is with us, then the path is going to be up and to the right. Right? Like if you're breathing, you've been called by God. You realize this. You have a great pastor who teaches you God's word. You have a calling. It's probably not to work at a church. Please don't come work at a church. I need spirit-filled, faith-filled accountants and coaches and teachers and homemakers and stay-at-home dads and ditch diggers and florists. People filled with God's spirit, seeing their world as a place that God has divinely placed them to not be a thermostat, I mean, not be a thermometer, but be a thermostat, to bring the kingdom of God to bear where you are. Guess why you're in that dorm you're in? You ain't in there because the school assigned you. You're there because God placed you there. That's your calling. And once you get a calling, then you do what you ought to do. Everybody makes a plan. 
Jesus said, you ought to have a plan. He said, which of you would build a tower without first stopping to make a plan, right? Look at me. It just doesn't ever go according to plan. Your plan always is up and to the right. And when it doesn't go, what you do is you confuse God's calling with your plan and you throw the whole thing out. As opposed to understanding it was God's calling, but it was your plan and ask God to help you adjust and change the plan to fulfill your calling. And anything you do in life that is worthwhile is an uphill climb pushing a canoe through the mud. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be hard. So a very small mem- a group of my team that work with me, as Troy said, I founded a church in January of 2000 in the back of a bar, really. Not because I was making a statement. It was just it was free, and when you're planting a church, it's hard to beat free. And, <laughs> and uh, God blessed it, and it grew. And what you don't know is, is that 10 years before that, I was pastoring a little church that had exploded in growth and I had a beautiful wife she is a testimony to uh, if you can fool one woman you are set man and uh, she loved Jesus with all her heart have two beautiful kids the church is growing and one night I sit straight up in my bed 10 years before this and I'm breathing hard and my hands are shaking Now, I know what you guys, especially next generation, you're going, oh, he's having a panic attack. Dude, this is almost 30 years ago. I'd never heard the word panic attack. I'd never heard the word depression. I didn't know anybody who'd ever been to a counselor. The only word I'd ever heard is nervous breakdown. My picture of that was my great uncle Jimmy who had a nervous breakdown. They said he got naked and walked down the middle of our town telling everybody he was Jesus. And I tell you that just not only because I like to say the word naked, it's funny, but I'll tell you because my picture was of somebody literally going crazy. I thought I was going crazy. She's asleep beside me. She has that gift of her, she's in rim before her head is fully compressed in the pillow. (laughs) I don't know what to do. So I'm a guy. I get up and start trying to walk it off. I just walk the hall of my house over, over, over again, walking it, walking it, walking it, walking it, walking it. I have a little sunken living room. I lay down on the living room floor, put my head on the step, have an eight-track player playing Mer- uh, Mercy Came A-Running by Philip Craig and Dean and begging God to do something. I had Gethsemane night after night, and God did nothing. I'd get up and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. At 5.30, I'd get back in bed to make sure she didn't know what was going on. Why didn't you tell her? Did I mention the seven-year-old little boy who laid in bed? Well, if she knew, she'd leave me. She'd take my kids. I'd lose my job. I did it for 17 days. People would come up to me and say, boy, pastor, you look good. Are you losing weight? And I couldn't tell them, no, I'm throwing up. And on day 17, As I drove my little pickup down I-35 south, major interstate, the Metroplex toward Fort Worth, I said I was going to run into a bridge abutment at 75 miles an hour. And the reason I tell you that as hard as it is to say is because I know what it's like to feel like the world would be better off without you. I know what it's like to convince yourself that you'll never be happy again. And if God would not have given me a picture at the very last moment of my wife telling my six-year-old daughter that daddy wasn't coming home, I would have never swerved, and it scared me. And I did the thing that I didn't want to do the most. I told the truth about where I was, not where I wanted to be, but where I was. And began this 27-year journey toward understanding true freedom. When I planted the church in the back of the bar, we did recovery for the first 20 weeks. 
I was in process. And everybody said we're at our 20-year birthday, my little team said, you need to write a book. And I'm like, who wants to write a book about, about running into a bridge and about all the ways the church hurt you? Who wants to do that? But Micah said, you ought to write a book. So I did what she said. And I wrote this book called Not Yet. And it's really just this, it's just a book of here's the biggest things I've learned over the past 20 years. The hard part of the book was the last chapter because my publisher said it needs to be good. How many of you know when they tell you something needs to be good, it freezes you up a little bit? And uh, I have this really cool assistant. Her name is Google. And I went to Google and I said, I kept thinking about a salmon fish. So I said, what's another fish like a salmon? And I learned about this goby fish found only in Hawaii. It swims halfway through its life, out of the ocean, up these mountain streams, literally starts jumping from rock to rock in the waterfall so it can live the rest of its life in these mountain pools, fresh water at the top of the big island. But the cool thing is, because I know what some of you are thinking, how does it get up those waterfalls? Well, as it's swimming upstream, its bottom jaw begins to grow out. I mean, there's pictures. You can Wikipedia. That bottom jaw grows out. It gives it more suction to grab the rocks. See, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. If you want to know how the kingdom works that you cannot see, look at the kingdom God created. You can. And that story was my story. The very thing that I was wanting to avoid was the very thing God was using to shape my life. I am a goby fish. And so as we did the series to launch the book, uh, one day I went back to my Google assistant and said, how do you draw a fish? And I found a seven and a half minute video that said, here's how you draw a cartoon fish. And for the next eight hours through three legal pads and four pencils, I just start and stop the deal. And I called my creative team and said, I need five easel boards on the stage. What are you going to do? I'm going to tell the story of, a, of this goby fish. What are you going to call it? Well, the fish is goby. My name is Toby. Sounds like Jesus to me. <laughs> and they said, you can't draw. And I said, yeah, I can. I've been on YouTube. And I drew this picture and sent it to them. And I told the story of Toby the Gobi, the little fish who learned three things. You can do hard things because God is with you. See, I grew up with my dad telling me, don't be a baby. Put, rub some dirt on it. Don't be scared. The reason I didn't call him in while I was seven, he'd go, that's stupid. Well, don't feel like that. Don't be a baby. Now, but now we have a generation of parents raising kids not saying, don't be a baby. We're all saying, oh, you poor baby. They're becoming victims, not victors. Hey, I struggle with anxiety. That's not going to happen. I'm a child of the king who is overcoming daily through the power of Jesus in my life. That's what's true about me. So I can do hard things because God is with me. Number two, I got to keep my eyes on the sun, right? Pastor Troy said it. We don't need more news. We need Jesus. I need to see the world through the lens of Jesus, keep my eyes on the sun. And number three, I need to help others along the way. That's the book, the little story of the fish that I told my daughter-in-law is a graphic artist, very accomplished. Her dream was to illustrate a kid's book. COVID hit three weeks later, and this was born. Toby the Gobi. It wasn't my plan 27 years ago. My plan was to not be anxious anymore. We just launched this book in South America. We're going to launch it in Hindi and in India. We're talking to people about launching it in the Middle East. It is sweeping this nation. And it wasn't my plan. But his ways are not my ways. You know why he did it? I finally figured it out. I'm going to show you a picture that someone sent me unsolicited. I didn't ask for it. They sent it to me. Look at this picture. This little boy. He's seven years old. He's an overthinker. He has convinced himself that something is getting him at night. His curtain is moving and there's something, a monster, a person, somebody out there getting it. You see what he's got beside his bed? Those are these 40 I am's printed out. He picked out five of them to remind him of the truth when he gets scared. This is my firstborn grandson. His name is Gideon. Hey, everybody look at me. This is my legacy. Right? Can you believe that 50 plus years later, a little seven year old boy that was asking God not to let him drum, that God would orchestrate events 
so that he could have something that that little boy never had. You have a legacy too. You just got to keep swimming. You just got to be journeying. Don't stop believing. When it's hard to believe, you got to remind yourself regularly who God says that you are. There is nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you. You are enough. You're enough when you're winning and you're enough when you feel like you're losing. He who began a good work in you will carry it on till the day of Christ Jesus. You have to keep walking. And God is at work behind the scenes to do stuff beyond what you could ever even dream. Can I pray for you? Thank you, Lord. I mean, I'm up here sharing all my mess. Surely you could raise your hand if you're struggling. Wherever you sit, would you just raise your hand that you're struggling? Even in the back, would you just, if you're struggling at some level, Now, you guys that have your hands up, only you, I, I would invite you to open your eyes and look around because I want to dispel the greatest lie out there that you're the only one. There are more people with hands up than down. <sighs> like, you're not alone. You're not broken. It's not just you. Like, God is with you. God is at work. You have to trust him. Could you just, people ask me all the time, when did you give your life to Jesus? I say, which time? Like, can we just give it to Jesus today, Father? We just give you our pain, and our, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we're starting to believe stuff that isn't true because it feels so true. And would you bring truth? Would you bring people in our lives to speak truth? And, man, is there somebody here that doesn't, that you've never known Jesus? You, you've been trying to do it on your own. If that's you, man, just raise your hand right now. I just want you to raise it high, and I, I just want you to know... Like, I see hands all over the room. I see you in the back. I see. Just say, in your heart, just say this, Jesus, I give you all of my stuff. And doing it myself isn't working, so I give it to you. And I thank you, Lord, that you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So bless these people as they begin this walk with you today. As many start for the first time and many start for the hundredth time. To remind us that your grace is enough, your power is available, and freedom is real. For thine is the kingdom and the power in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir.